Today, creativity simultaneously, a teacher of Hebrew word, Bozmanit, simultaneously, cre- gave rise to the basic body plans of all modern multicellular animals. 600 million years ago, a remarkable burst of evolutionary creativity simultaneously gave rise to the basic body plans of all modern multicellular animals. See, I didn't learn it simultaneously. Here's how I learned it. This is from the same magazine, but 1978. The famous Tree of Life. This is the Cambrian Explosion. This explosion is called the Cambrian Explosion. This is that line here. Then first came sponges, and then came mollusks, and then came worms, and then came, and then came, and then... They don't print this any longer in Scientific American. There's no embarrassment about it, except the fact that it was canonized in textbooks. So everyone that went to school learned first came sponges, then came worms, then came... See, I learned it, and probably you all learned it also, right? And, as, and although subjectively I can say the words, they all happen simultaneously, intellectually it's imprinted in my, my brain that first came sponges and then came worms. Because, no, because the reality of the world is if you take a sparrow away from its mother when it's still in its egg and never let it hear tweedledee tweedledum and raise it on its side and play in the background some music like, let's say, come on baby, light my fire, It will attempt to tweedle out, come on, baby, light my fire, and it will never learn tweedledee, tweedledum, because the song a sparrow learns in its youth is its song for life. And humans are not much different. It takes a tremendous intellectual effort to give up the idea that first came sponges, and then came worms, and then came, and then came. And if you look at the checks on this, it was an explosion of life. That picture from Time magazine shows you that it was all in the waters. It was the first animal life. Score again, right down the line. So in the day six, the landowners, I just have to end it at this point here. I just have this one example. This is a trilobite. It dates back to this period, 550 million years old. It's the oldest of the insects. Now you have to understand, now there, I don't, this is not a perfect one. The perfect ones, obviously, as I said, are in the museums. Underneath this, deeper down in the fossil record, they are fossils. See, it had always been the hope when the Cambrian explosion was discovered about a hundred years ago that other fossils existed to show the gradual evolution over all this time because there weren't fossils from that. But now the fossil record extends from here back to here, okay? From this back down to the beginning of the first simple forms of life. But those fossils before this time are either one-celled like the green in water, polluted water, algae it's called. Be careful when you drink water. Not in Israel, thank God, it's clearing, but if you go to other countries you drink the wrong water, you might get an algae, then you'll be sick for a few weeks. Okay, or, oh yeah, now, now I tell you, see, so she had this talk at the beginning before I went to Jordan. <laughs> anyway, or globs or globs. And then out of nowhere comes all the basic body plants, including this body plant, the first of the insect. Notice how structured it is. Section body, the perfect ones had jointed limbs, claws, mouths, not with a jaw, but mouths, gills, intestines, and most amazingly of all, eyes. Eyes. Now the perfect fossils fossilize so gently, so with such fine sediment, that the shape of the lenses is preserved. Anyone know a bit about, about zoology? Insects, do they have one lens or many lenses? Many lenses. What is it called? Complex or compound eye? I don't recall. Really compound eye, huh? Compound eye, I'm not sure. The lenses of the insect eye were optically perfect. Perfect lenses out of nowhere. And those are the data. And no one disputes them. The biggest skeptics in the world accept this as reality. What does it mean? You can draw your own conclusions. These fossils were discovered by a man named Charles D. Walcott. He was the director of the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. The first of these fossils were found in Canada, in the Burgess Shale, near near Calvary, if you go east, Calvary, you go, uh, Calvary, you you you, you go west further into the mountains. They've now been discovered around the world. Charles D. Walcott collected of these fossils before the Canadians discovered he was shipping them back to Washington, D.C. 60,000 fossils. 60,000 fossils. 
What do you think? You thought they were important? The court of the moral is no book. 60,000 fossils. Fossils showing worms and sponges and mollusks. Yeah, he thought they were real important. The only fact is he discovered them in 1909. Buried them away in the drawers of the Smithsonian Institute. They were rediscovered in 1985, and the world picture of evolution changed overnight. Like in 1965, we discovered the echo of the Big Bang. And we now know there was a creation. In 1985, these fossils were rediscovered. And suddenly, to use the Hebrew, it became kosher to talk about it. And now suddenly, the, they're found in Africa, they're found in Australia, they're found in China, they're found in Greenland, they're found in Sweden. They weren't found before. No one could believe it. Some, that's what's called cognitive dissonance. The song I learned in my youth is my song for life. The great thing about having a person like Zola or other persons that can teach you is there's no need to make errors in the world. There's a lot of information out there and the choice, as in Deuteronomy, the choice is defined. It's interesting, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 is the only place that the, the Hebrew Bible says choose. And it says choose between, not between good and evil, choose between life and death. Because no one chooses between good and evil. The most evil person in the world gets up in the morning and says, I'm going to do good today. I'm going to kill a more few people, rob a few more banks, you know, because that, in the evil person's mind, he thinks he's choosing good. Talk to trial lawyers. All of their clients say they were doing the right thing. I mean, I had to bump off that guy. You know, he was tripping my kids. I got to kill him. You know, I did the right thing. And he goes, to, the jury may not agree with him. The reality is we have a chance to choose properly, and all we need is information. And thank God, literally, the information is out there. And we have the sources of information. So I wish you a pleasant stay in my hometown now by Jerusalem, and I hope you will all enjoy yourselves. Yeah.